Hej och välkomna till den här kvartal två rapportgenomgången med oss Design. Jag heter Robert Tovi och är analyschef på Erik Pense Bank. Jag ersätter vår analytiker Peter Selej som tyvärr har förhinder. Med mig idag för att prata om oss Design och kvartalsrapporten har jag Morten Hennefeld som är CEO. Welcome yeah. Morten. Thank you very much. Uh, and congrats on a, on a really nice uh, Q2 report. Thank you. So maybe if uh, we could start off with you uh, giving us just a short uh, rundown of uh, what OS Design is all about. Yeah, uh, OS Design is a, uh, a, a company operating in the uh, orthopedic industry, um, an upcoming player. We um, today participate in two different segments in that industry in, in, in our uh, CMF or cranial. Uh, and then we acquired a, a company in 2020 called ZeroCost and entered the, the orthobiologic space. Um, so today we, we are in those two with a significant shift now, as I'm sure we'll talk about, into the orthobiologic. And uh, from, from uh, that introduction, let's uh, move into uh, the Q2 uh, report and uh, the numbers yeah. and the dynamics. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Yes, we reported a, a really strong uh, second quarter again. 92% uh, um, reported growth, 79% uh, uh, on a consequency basis. We are seeing, I think we're seeing some, some, some important things right now in the company. One, we are seeing the, the growth being very sustainable. Uh, it's driven by, by strong underlying uh, uh, growth in our customer base, more recurrent users and so on. Uh, that's one thing. Number two, The second quarter also marked a, a transformative shift in the company in the sense that our orthobiologic business now became the largest um, within only 18 months of actively selling. Um, the third one that I wanted to highlight is the US. We, are, we have an exceptional momentum right now in the US. Our rolling 12 month momentum is up three times. We reported 148% growth. Um, this is the fifth consecutive quarter of triple digit growth now in the US. Um, so then, we, then we also want some very large customers, uh, these so-called IDNs, integrated delivery networks that are really hard to get into. Um, and last but not least, I think the quarter uh, and the report also clearly demonstrated the scalability that we're now seeing in the company and then in, in, in the second quarter, that's also translated into uh, operating leverage. So basically, we're seeing quite a few strategic shifts here uh, in terms of, of geography. Uh, the U.S. market is is really growing, and maybe that's where where you're you're putting your your focus. Uh, also, we're seeing uh, the kind of little brother in terms of products uh, being uh, uh, the main product area uh, now. Yeah. And lastly, you're, you're moving into a new kind of, of uh, client uh, uh, area with larger, uh, bigger clients. Yeah. Do you see that? Do you see that trajectory uh, uh, continuing? I mean, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I think it's pretty evident when, when you read the report and, and we can talk a little bit. Of, I also just want to go back two and a half years to when we launched the strategy. This is exactly in line with our strategy. If anyone remember the five strategic priorities we announced, number one is win in the US and number two is build an orthobiologic business. So yes, you're absolutely, absolutely right. In 2020, um, uh, Ostesign was a cranial company with a dominant footprint in, uh, uh, in Europe, where US was actually quite a, quite a marginal part of the business. Now, three years later, We are an orthobiologics company with a very strong US uh, dominated footprint. Orthobiologics is now more than 50% of the business on sales, significantly more on gross profit. Um, and US is now 72% of, of the business in the quarter. And, and I think those two shifts are, are, are profound because what you're seeing that is translating into also increased profitability. So in the second quarter, we also, uh, We also report a gross margin uh, uh, for the first time. If you look at the first uh, six months, that's a 14 percentage point drop on last year. And we also actually showed the development in the last three years where we showed that gross margin has gone from 46% in 2020 
to now being 77% in the second quarter and 76 for the first six months. So yes, the strategic shifts that we've also driving through the acquisition and the strategy that is happening right now and is having a, a, a very profound impact on the profitability profile of the company. So, uh, Morten, could you could you talk a little bit about the sales process because we we just recently talked about uh, you uh, aiming distributors. How how do you approach the doctors um, uh, and and um, are there when you when you see uh, question marks from doctors what could they be about? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we, you know, as we've said, uh, the ultraviolotics business is, is quite a competitive business. That's absolutely no secret. There's quite a lot of offering. Um, I think what we're bringing to market, um, and you can see that with the market acceptance, it, that it, it really resonates with surgeons. Uh, one, um, all bone graft clearances are, are done on a, a sort of 510k, which means it's on preclinical studies. And what we've shown in our bone uh, animal study is the best clinical data that we are aware of, um, actually outperforming both uh, 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 master graft from Medtronic and even um, and even autograph, which is FDA's gold standard, so the patient's own bone. And and the second one we're seeing is some very strong handling skills and it's, it's often an underrated area because you cannot clinically prove what it is but it essentially means that a surgeon it works well in the, in, in the hands of a surgeon during the operation and also that the surgeon can rest assured and feel confident that the bone graft doesn't dissolve making sure that you get bone growth exactly where you want it and not where you don't want it um, so these are these are these are two things that are very important for for surgeons and we're really demonstrating that in particular, the handling, I would say, is really seems to be based on our feedback we're getting from surgeons, really setting us apart. Um, so yeah, it, it, that just makes us very unique and differentiated when it comes to how it actually works in the hands of surgeons, and that's extremely meaningful. Can, can we talk a little bit about the, the addressable market? Because I think uh, you've mentioned that uh, it's about the 2.6 billion US dollar market. Yeah. Uh, is all that addressable for you, or is is it mainly a part of, of that market uh, in in general? And yeah. then, how do you? What are your thoughts on on the geographical mix within yeah. the U.S. market? Yeah, I mean, if we start with the market size, so the two point two point six billion that's the global, but one point eight billion of that is is in the U.S. alone. Then there are uh, different ways you can you can solve a. A, a, a problem, you can use the patient's own bone, that's called autograft, you can use a donor-based product, that's called allograft, or you can use a synthetic bone graft like we are bringing, we are bringing to market. Um, I think there are some three important developments happening right now, which is also driving tailwind. Um, one is that we keep getting older and we have the baby boomers. So we have a constant flow and increase in volume in this business and will have for, for the next many, many years. Uh, secondly, we have had some quite unfortunate events happening on, on these donor-based products where uh, diseases have been transmitted. There was a big tuberculosis case a while ago where patients died. Um, and I think also, you know, after COVID and everyone is a little bit more paying attention to transmitted diseases, um, we are seeing a more of a reluctance to use donor-based products, which means that surgeons have begun to use more synthetic bone grafts. And when they then look at synthetic bone graft in itself, well then there's many, many products on the market, also products that are 20 years old. And we are see, clearly seeing, and we re represent the fourth generation product line, um, we're seeing a big shift from the early, early technologies into the later technologies, simply because the efficacy uh, is just better uh, on those products. So I think we, we, we are in the right space at the right time um, with, with a very differentiated product that, 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 as you can see from the sales numbers, is going really well. And, and how, uh, how is it possible uh, in such a, a scientific market that you can, ha you can have a 20-year-old product that's still on the market and, yeah. and still competing? Um, and, and how is your product better than a 20-year-old product? Uh, well, I think on, on this one specifically, we were actually tested in, on 60 rabbits and, and, and looked at fusion rates. So I think on, on this particular question, 
we actually prove uh, we proved it very clinically. Um, in general, I think you know synthetic bone graft it, back in the days was was essentially designed to find a solution to um, where you don't have to harvest. Typically, you would harvest uh, bone from the patient's own hip or iliac crest. That's extremely painful, leads to increased hospitalization. So there was uh, an endeavor to try to find a synthetic solution uh, to, to that problem. Um, I think early on, I don't think the product performed as well as people had, uh, had hoped. Uh, but I think as we demonstrated right now with our preclinical data, we actually outperformed uh, both uh, using the patient's own bone, which as I said, is FDA's gold standard. And we even outperformed uh, a product that has been in the market for a period of time. So um, I think we've done everything we can um, to, to help us actually deliver this successful uh, early commercialization, right? I think we, all, we, we need to keep that in mind. We are only about 18 months into the commercialization actively selling, right? We technically, we launched it or more or less on the day two years ago. Um, but as you know, it takes time to get approved in, in hospitals and so on. So it's still early days and we're extremely happy with what we're seeing. So I think you delivered some 77% some uh, gross margins, yeah. um, uh, which of course is extremely strong. Yeah. Uh, how how uh, does that compare to the cranial business uh, gross margins? Yeah. Um, and also, how scalable from this level is is uh, the business model? Yeah. Well, um, uh, let me maybe put it into context. We actually don't report by, by franchise, but now we have 50-50 split. People can probably do the math. Um, I think it's, 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 it's important to look at it in the context. Back in 2020, when we were only a cranial company with a large uh, European footprint relative to the US. Um, we had 46% in, in, in gross margin. Then um, in the first year of the turnaround, we, uh, we defocused on some products, we revamped some parts of the company, and I think we saw a, an impact of about 12 percentage point increase largely because of that. From 21 and the and the and the um, 58 into the 77 we are now reporting, that can all be attribu attributed to the launch uh, entry into bio of biologics and the launch of Aspartan Catalyst. Um, so there's no doubt, there's no doubt that this is very very scalable, right? We've been able to do this. Uh, yes, we've had some cost increases over the three years. But, but nothing comparable to, to what's actually driving the, 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 the catalyst acceleration. So I think there's no doubt, uh, people can see now also in the numbers how scalable it is, how it has significantly transformed the company from a cranial to now essentially being an orthobiologics company with a large European footprint. And we're seeing that translating into increased scalability, better ASPs, increased gross profit, and for this quarter also, now we're seeing it in terms of operating leverage. And so, of course, this is exactly what we hope to see when we acquired Silicos uh, about three years ago. Um, and it's pleasing to see that it's actually delivering to that yield model we did back then. So then lastly, maybe a few words on, on your focus at this point and, and where, do you, where do you see the company in, in a couple of years? Yeah. No, but I think as we also said during the, 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 the quarterly report or the earnings call, um, we're seeing some very significant shift in, in the company. We're seeing shift uh, with now, by and large, the, the business being US-based. We're seeing significant shift into orthobiologics. Um, and as biologics right now has a more scalable profile, it has a, a uh, faster growing profile and has a higher gross profitability profile, as we also guided previously, typically at 90 and 90 plus. Um, of course, as you fast forward, um, you will very, very clearly see that the trends we're seeing right now will only continue, and that's the way the company is going. Sounds great. Yeah, we, we think it is. Um, this was, um, I think it's important when you, uh, uh, um, uh, when you buy a company, of course, at that time, you, you also make promises to the market about what you think it can deliver. So, of course, it's pleasing to sit here three, we, uh, three years later and look back and see and say we're actually delivering on what we said it could uh, way back uh, when. Um, 
Um, so yes, well, I think the the I think the acquisition and the influence of the biologics has significantly transformed the company, and and so certainly have set us up for a very very different future. Great, looking forward to uh, to see the company uh, continue its its uh, journey. Uh, Morten, uh, uh, thank you very much for for coming, and uh, good luck for uh, the rest of the year. Thank you thank very you. much. Och tack till alla er som har tittat.